So I'm Ben Schneider, I'm a professor of computer science at University of Maryland, uh, and I'm working on social media. I'm proud that I'm a member of the National Academy of Engineering, which highlights the, the importance of human-computer interaction and usability. My goal here is not so much to tell you about my own work, but to sort of set the uh, uh, table and tell you about what we've been doing. Jenny, Priest, and I, Jenny's been really a leader in this area for a long time, for more than 15 years. Her book in the year 2000 was called Online Communities, the first major book that described this, research book that described this area, very influential, and has had a profound uh, impact on, on many of people working in this area. Uh, so that was uh, an important thing. I'm, my background's in physics, as, uh, as uh, uh, Pat O'Shea said, but I became a computer scientist, and, uh, and I'm happily that way, but I call myself 20% of an experimental psychologist in having, for the last 30 years, promoted the idea of human-computer interaction, founding the HCI, or CHI conference, uh, in Gaithersburg in 1982, and having written the book called Designing the User Interface, first in 85-6, but now in its fifth edition with Catherine Plaisant, my colleague here, who will be joining us a little bit later today and in the evening. So my topic has been this HCI, and more recently, InfoViz. And now I like to say I'm 5% of a sociologist. Will you give me, grant me that mark? Six and a half. Six and a half. I'm getting there. I'm getting up there. What? I'm in seven. Seven. All right. <laughs> so, you know, that's it. And as you can see, we sort of put ourselves out there. Please do follow us if you want to hear our stories. We do think uh, these conferences are an interesting event. And part of the conference monitor tool measures the success of the conference by the increased number of followers as well as by retweets and so on. So we're trying to encourage you to retweet the tweets that you see, and we want to reach out beyond this room so that other people will know. All the videos of the presentations will be through PJ's Good Deeds, will wind up on the web, uh, and this year, since we, uh, we got the support from NSF, we will be doing transcriptions and full text transcriptions, and if we get to it, closed captioning, uh, for deaf participants. So that's important to us, and that's our story at the University of Maryland. We're both pleased to represent the Human Computer Interaction Lab, which this year celebrates its 30th anniversary. Uh, it's the longest standing research lab in that group. I was the founding director, but then Ben Peterson, Allison Druin, and now Jen Goldbeck are the directors. Jen will be here as well today, and she'll be speaking uh, later in this week. This is an interdisciplinary community at Maryland. Uh, computer science and the iSchool are both the, the supporting partners, but there are many others, and you've heard, already mentioned the myth, Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. So for me, one of the great fun things is the interdisciplinarity of it. And, you know, I was raised in the age of Marshall McLuhan. He sort of liberated me from the narrow specialist view and said that it was okay to be a generalist. And, you know, so I'm dangerously eclectic and find myself into new disciplines uh, periodically, which is great fun for me. I like being a dilettante. I like being a graduate student at every age that I can be and learning something new and making a contribution. So what I claim is that I'm the best generalist, so I bring across ideas across disciplines and the strategies that we develop uh, are useful there. So that's really important to me. I loved hearing your introductions and the different disciplines. Of course, I've done a little homework, so I know a little bit about the disciplinary spread here, but by a show of hands and take a look around, um, how many of you consider yourselves primarily iSchool information oriented? I mean, you can raise your hand more than once. Hi, raise your hands high. And that was the largest group that I saw in the uh, registration. How many in computer science? That was a smaller group. Okay. Uh, communications turns out to be a large group. Look around. We have very strong devotion to communications. Here again, you can raise your hand more than once. Okay. Library. We, we had some libraries. Oh, the library <laughs> and information systems. Okay. Oh, that's shying away. Now, we do have, you know, also then there's one anthropologist here. Oh, there she is, <laughs> right? You said so. Okay. And we did have. Uh, uh, writing studies, but we also have English here. So those are really interesting new and English part of the myth. We've had one good history with myth, the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, moving forward, expanding, and building up in good ways. 
We've had, of the 54 of you who are officially registered here, those all have been carefully chosen. In addition, as you heard, there are six or eight other people from the Maryland campus who have joined and are hanging out, but the official registrants were in that group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to push me along. <laughs> okay, so I just think the interdisciplinary representation is really important, both for the clusters as well as the outliers. So speak up if you're an anthropologist writing studies or English and you have a different point of view. We do want to hear those points of view. And remember, the strong and weak ties all work. You know all that. Okay, so, <laughs> um, the, you know, part we start from is the sort of HCI pride, 30 years of history. Those 5 billion users of mobile devices are due not just to Moore's Law, but we did some of that too. And we want the credit, we want the visibility. There is fortunately a growing awareness of the role of user interface. This week, our colleague Ben Peterson is busy testifying in critical national, international cases involving the rights and uses of uh, the, the mobile technologies. But we were the people, this group, the people in this room and their advisors helped make all the difference in supporting a diverse set of users, a diverse set of applications, and a wide variety of powerful interfaces that are truly changing the way we live, work, and play. Okay, next 50 years. Where are we going and why are we here? Why do we spend our time on this organizing this? Why we think it's so important to get you together. We know that while some of you are well accepted and beloved in the disciplines you're in, some of you are also struggling and facing challenges that the work you're doing is kind of weird, different, not mainstream, not core. And so we're here to help make you core and make you get beyond that and make you become the leaders, okay? Uh, or among the leaders, let's say. So we do think, there's, we've, we've read the, the, the newspapers, the books, and so on. Apparently 41%, my Kindle tells me, through Barry Wellman and Lee Rainey's. They're both, uh, both people you've heard their names. Lee Rainey will be speaking downtown on Thursday. Uh, their book called Networked tells the story in a very powerful way. I was charmed as I read through the book to see the names of people from this conference like Nancy Bain, uh, you know, like Sarita Yardi, our former students. They're, they're mentioned throughout this book in terms of contributing to that area. Okay, so we do believe there's good deeds to be done. We're very oriented towards pro-social activities. That's the history of the HCIL. Um, and, but yet we're aware of the challenges. So this is not naturally going to turn out well. There's lots of reasons, and Pat O'Shea referred to this, that this could go bad. Uh, that if we're not careful, if we don't work hard, if we don't devote ourselves to the pro-social positive outcomes, there's a real chance that malicious forces can compromise these technologies and that we will be embarrassed by the technology that we have built. I think we, more than ever in this discipline, face the challenge that the physicists of the 1940s faced, which was they created an amazing, powerful technology which they hoped would bring world peace and uh, and, and benefits in many ways, uh, you know, energy too cheap to meter, uh, and many, many positive things, but it also brought many challenges and dangers. And so we are in that situation, and I do think, I mean quite seriously, to commit you, you know, in parts to the policy, you know, to the technology, write your great papers, but also keep a fraction of your attention to the policy-related issues and Think about how we are going to make this turn out to be a happy story so that you can tell your grandchildren that what you did during the social media revolution, okay? You want to be proud of that, okay? So we've been thinking about this, as I say, Jenny, for 15 years and myself for, you know, I became more en entranced with this and we began in 2009. Um, we had a meeting here, 25 people. I don't think any of the people here attended that one, but some of our speakers did. They paid their own way to come here. We sat and worked, and we wrote a 50-page white paper that's still out there that tries to charter this notion and say, hey, this is really important. Pay attention. Something's happening. Okay? I wrote a letter to, and that appeared in AAAS Science asking for a national initiative in, in, in social participation and saying this is something to pay attention. This should become a NASA level, an NIH level, you know, uh, attention issue because it's important. Jenny and I went to get NSF funding with our colleague Peter Paroli from PARC um, and uh, did uh, run two workshops, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, to bring together 
30 people in each location that represented industry, government, academia, and we wrote uh, seven papers which appeared in, uh, 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 in this special issue of IEEE Computer, November 2010. And it laid out the territory for these things. David smiling, have you, uh, what was your, <laughs> you're familiar. No, of course. Yeah, so we believe this was influential. We published in the computer, uh, IEEE computer, because we did want to reach the technology people. They gave us a fast route to publication. And so, although this was held in early 2010, um, we, we were in print by November and reached a large audience. So, do we have impact? I would say the story is a mixed story. We're not yet there. The people in this room, the colleagues we talked to, all believe this is a really important topic, but not everyone does. And as you know, vested interests in existing technologies and disciplines will work to suppress the growth of new disciplines. And so we do have to be active, and we have to make that battle. Now, the good news is the December 2010 report from the national, from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. This is the way Washington works, by reports, boring, gray-covered reports, um, which are written by very interesting, powerful people, included uh, Eric Schmidt of you know, Google and uh, Craig Mundy of uh, Microsoft and many other really interesting, powerful, thoughtful people. Um, and here it did, you know, we were getting our, we felt we were getting our message across. Investment in the science of social networking, crowdsourcing, and other emerging paradigms that exploit extreme scale usage, scalable systems. So this is what they were supporting. Notice how their tie-in between the social science and the opening of the sentence, and then the high-tech aspect. So we think that's the, the formula that we've uh, and described in many cases, there's three things you've got to do if you're going to make an impact. One, claim national priorities. That's why we tried to focus. And I was so pleased that your descriptions demonstrated your interest and devotion to issues of substance, of importance. National priorities in many countries and things that are positive in terms of people's social lives. We are quite convinced that Google and Facebook and Twitter and Yahoo will do an excellent job in studying discretionary use and playful things and entertainment and e-commerce. And that is fine. What we want to do is invigorate the public sector to address the national priorities to make sure that they get addressed. And so in that report, it has this, I have used this a lot, creating a science of social computing. When I show that to my colleagues, they say, wow, you know, that's something new. Scientists and technologists don't yet know how to take the lessons of one success or failure and apply it to another problem, okay? So that's what we're after. National priorities, deep science, and extreme technologies. We've got to put all three of them together. And as you think about your projects, we want you to think not just about the national priorities, not just about the deep science, but then what are the technologies that make it happen? We want you to think about the implications for design. We want to know what your advice is in, in, in terms of the, the technologies that are still needed. In the social sciences, sometimes the researchers assume the technology is fixed or given, and then we study the usage, but no. This technology is fluid, dynamic, and changing. And our goal, we believe here, is to shape the future of technology, not just to study its current status. That's a really important distinction. I've, I've had, I know some of you in sociology, and I've had, you know, and Alan and I have talked about this too, that you know, the goal often stated is to understand the usage, the social impact of these technologies. But we want to do more than understand. We want to change it, OK? So, we are here with, a, I hope, a shared purpose to look and see how we can understand it so that we know enough about the theory that will give us predictive power and prescriptive elegance to be able to guide the future generation of designers. We're not alone in this. There are international efforts uh, in many places. Um, I think you'll find most compatible with us the European Society of Socially Embedded Technologies. Their manifesto is quite close to the papers we had written in 2000, uh, 2009. European Commission on Joint Research Center uh, has two very powerful reports about the impact of social media on European economies. And the Chinese Academy of Sciences has put 
huge, about 200 researchers to work on the idea of social media uh, study. You may know of other efforts as well, or we could talk about them. Now, just, you know, elevating even further, I use this slide in almost every one of my talks in computer science and elsewhere, but I think, you know, our requirements definition for our work should come from things like this. The UN Millennium Development Goals set out in the year 2000 by the nations of the UN to end poverty and hunger, promote universal education, gender equality, child health, maternal health, combat HIV AIDS, environmental sustainability, global partnership. The report from the year 2000 is not terribly encouraging. While there are some successes in certain countries, the progress by the metrics established by the UN show not the kind of progress we'd like to see. Currently, the UN is formulating groups that will, for 2015, produce a new set of goals for the year 2030. And based on this experience of these 15 years, seek to develop more refined goals and more effective techniques for achieving those goals. So I just, you know, would like to be part of a discipline, a community, who sees this as part of their agenda. I know, and you should, devote yourself to your research project, doing great research, publishing important papers, but somewhere, keep in mind, I hope your influence will be in that, will come from noble and global aspirations and inspirations. Okay, so here's what we saw as the goals for this conference. I sent this out in email, so most of you may have gotten it. But we do want to clarify what national priorities we can address, which ones we really care about, where we can have the greatest impact. We do believe there's deep science uh, questions here to understand. To me, as I, I, I wrote also, I last week attended Aspen Institute's uh, uh, talk by Lisa Randall, the Harvard physicist superstar, and she waxed poetic about the Higgs boson and how it was so important and amazing and terrific and fantastic and wonderful. And I would say it's equally important to understand the trigger for human participation. Okay, the Higgs boson generates mass, we generate participation. What is the Higgs boson of human collaboration, of human participation, of social cooperation? How do we understand that? Okay, this is already a quest well established in sociology and other disciplines, but it's a totally new game in the world of social media. For the first time in history, much of what we do is online. And for the first time in history, we have the tools that will enable us to understand, to take the pulse of culture as it is going. Okay? And that's what's really different. Now, taking social science down the road of big data, quantified analysis, and these statistical tools is not easy. Okay, not everyone thinks it's the right way. Mixed methods, and Jenny is a great advocate of trying to put these together, uh, are really important. We'll be getting that throughout the talks. We've encouraged the speakers to focus on their research methods to highlight what tools and techniques they're using, because we think that's going to shape the success of this discipline. Okay, so the research methods are new, the, and we do think the old era of controlled experimental science, which even propagates into social sciences, um, still has a lot to offer, but the idea of what we call interventions, where you're working at scale on real systems and making a change. Sometimes this is called A-B testing, a term that came from Amazon originally, and Ron Kahavi at Microsoft and Google picked up and so it went. The idea that if you want to know, if Amazon wants to know about selling books, well, they could make the pictures of the books bigger or they could add more text about the books. And they could make that experiment and you know have 10,000 users try one version and 10,000 users try another. And in not a few hours, but a couple of weeks, if you read Ron Kahavi's methods, you get a pretty good answer. Now that answer may change if you do if those weeks happen to be during, you know, the winter holidays, it may not be representative, etc. But pretty well, you get a lot of interesting data and you rapidly change the uh, design of the interface and you can make these changes and many, many such evaluations. So Amazon 
had a very small usability testing effort, but it had a very large online in-situ interventions. Now, Ron Kahavi, in his writings about this, does call them experiments. But I don't think they're experiments in the sense of being controlled in the usual way. I think of them as interventions. I want a different word because, to me, experiments suggest the laboratory study that's in a controlled environment. And when I talk about an intervention, I mean an existing real-world system that we are actually changing. Now, not all of you have access to such large-scale systems. And university groups like the Michigan Movie Lens effort, uh, Minnesota Movie Lens effort, was designed to create an environment for such, uh, such testing. But I think increasingly, companies understand that they may benefit by partnering with universities and allowing those uh, collaborations. The extreme technology changes, challenges, security, privacy, scalability, all those issues. I guess I've gotten my trust, empathy, responsibility, uh, and privacy. Uh, terps for those who <laughs> follow that, but trust, empathy, responsibility, and privacy are my sort of mantra. I also suggest that the language will have to change while the Moore's Law people have promoted for successfully for 40 years the idea that we should measure progress by the gigahertz and the megabytes and that and, the, and, the, and the, the terror, whatever. And I think, you know, we need to change the language because for us, the success stories will be if we measure the number of giga contribs and mega collabs and terra thank yous. And that's where, you know, you may have a better measure, but let's start by shifting the language. And in the world of technology, I often say, you know, that, that we have a history of saying you are what you eat, but in technology, you become what you measure. And if we think that Terra thank yous are what we want and uh, mega contribs, that's what we've got to measure. So Wikipedia is about 100 mega contribs. Contribs are the word that Wikipedia uses to measure an individual contribution. They don't have a measure of collabs, the number of collaborations. But I can tell you that the number of, t the amount of text on the Wikipedia discussion pages is larger than the amount of text in Wikipedia. So there are collaborations and discussions going on by a much smaller group. And that's what I think we need to understand. Uh, we do want to influence national policy. That's still a struggle. We'll talk more about it. And increase educational opportunity, something we can do. Here's our way of increasing educational opportunity. We hope many of you will go back to your campuses and ask your faculty to say, well, why is there no course on social media? And we don't just want a seminar course at the graduate level for six students. We want a required undergraduate course for 600 students. Okay, that's what we see as needing to happen. All right, and some of the faculty in this room and in this session in this week uh, are leaders in teaching social media at the graduate and undergraduate level in creating the audiences and making this topic a significant one. Uh, I would say another role for universities is the outreach to work with um, uh, the uh, industries and help educate them and give them access to the opportunities that universities do provide. Okay, uh, just for a few minutes in my remaining time, I'll just sort of say a few of the things that have happened that we think give us the kind of indication of promise that this may actually turn out to be a good thing. I mean, Jenny and I are first, we usually don't write together. We, we help each other. Her books have also, you know, I, should, I mentioned her online communities book, but she is one of the team that wrote the book called, um, uh, <laughs> what do I say? Interaction. Interaction Design. <laughs> so Interaction Design uh, with Jenny and Yvonne Rogers and Helen Sharp is the other leading book in the, in the field that is used for human-computer interaction. And that's been a very influential role as well. So we help each other, but when generally we haven't worked together. If, if you don't know, we are married, so that's another story. Uh, but, uh, and, and we did work together to write a one-page paper. That we could do. Uh, and it called for a uh, title was 911.gov. And it came from my uh, fumbling around with my browser, typing in 911, and you know, and things like 911, getting nothing useful. I mean, it really was. And it struck me that the internet could be used as a mechanism in disaster response. And so uh, we had three uh, 
arguments there that residents could report information to your mobile device. You fall to the ground, you press, you know, nine, and it sends your location timestamp and to a centralized control center that might accumulate hundreds or thousands of these, and it would create a very rapid, easy way to collect data. And then professionals could disseminate instructions on a block-by-block -block basis to stay in place or evacuate, or there will be buses in this shopping center at 4 o'clock to help evacuate you from the city. And the tougher one was resident-to-resident -resident assistance. Could you envision that you would agree to take Mr. Jones in his wheelchair in apartment 301 with you when you evacuate the city? That's a big commitment to make. But we were inspired by the tragedy of the summer of 2003 when in France 15,000 older adults died in a heat wave because no one brought them a bottle of water or took them to an air-conditioned place. Similarly in Chicago that summer, 1,100 people died, okay, 1,100 elders. So that produced, I mean, it's a one-page paper, but it produced the largest response of any paper I've ever written. And within hours of the embargo lifting, it was on the BBC, on Discovery Channel, on you know, Newsweek, and it was all over the world, produced a great trigger of excitement that I hope pushed ahead interest. Now, that date, February 16th, it brings chills to my back here still when I think about it. Some of you may know the date, April 16th, 2007. Does that have significance for anyone here? That's interesting. That's the date of the shootings at Virginia Tech. Okay, some of you were getting there. Okay, and in that, uh, uh, that tragic event, the, the shooter killed two people at the periphery of campus at 7.45 in the morning, and then came to the center of campus, and the other 30 deaths were in, at, at uh, 9.15 in the morning. So it was an hour and a half, and many people wondered, had there been an alerting system on SMS or other mechanism, would the day have turned out differently? So most universities, Maryland as well, and you register for it, and every Wednesday at 11.55 a.m. I get a test message, and it's been used a dozen times in the years when there has been a you know, police incident, a flood, a fire, uh, and we've had this earthquake, right? <laughs> Last year we had an earthquake, the first time in my life I had it, we had an earthquake, but we had one here, we also had a hurricane, so we're hoping for, uh, it just shows we, we can overcome all those things. Anyway, uh, this produced a strong response. There are many other um, disaster reporting mechanisms. The U.S. Ge Geological Survey has a Did You Feel It website to report uh, earthquakes and then many local storm reporting. Um, we've worked closely and our NSF SOX grant uh, was to study the Nation of Neighbors, a community safety group, and uh, that was founded by Art Johnson here uh, in the Washington DC area. It's become a national effort with 400 online groups already. Disaster response for wildfires through Flickr. The Amber Alert, 8 million people have an icon on their desktop that is the Amber Alert and agree to participate in this. Amber was a child who was abducted uh, and uh, so this is in her memory. She was killed sadly. Uh, but uh, this group claims more than 500 uh, abductions that they helped uh, solve and maybe thousands that they prevented by raising awareness. Um, Patients Like Me is a brilliant idea of uh, uh, three young guys, uh, MIT grad students, and two of them are brothers, and they had a third brother who died of Lou Gehrig's disease, and they built this. It's now ongoing a number of years. A great success story in enabling patients to track their chronic disease and its treatment. Uh, this slide used to have Google Health on it, but Google Health, as you may know, didn't make it. So it again reminds us that even powerful, well-funded organizations do not yet, you know, not necessarily succeed when they go to address health issues. We don't quite know how to do that. And so that's, you know, important. That's an important national priority. There are doctor-to-doctor -doctor nets in the U.S. and in, and in the U.K., Energy sustainability, this is the Department of Energy's Energy Star effort, um, and voluntary service. The Obama administration has been quite effective in trying to go uh, and, and make uh, a more communal approach to having voluntary service, but also having public commentary on regulatory 
uh, issues and, and just many issues. I mean, if you're the kind of policy wonk, uh, uh, you might want to look at the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy. Their blog site is really deep and fascinating. The, uh, the staff of that, of that organization post important issues, for example, the discussion of can the government run challenges? And the 120 lengthy, thoughtful, deep responses to that just really brilliantly reflected the deliberation that can happen uh, in these kind of environments. Um, I had the pleasure to help in some of this in recovery.gov. Uh, Obama promised that you could track every dime that was spent, and this website helped make that a reality, and so I was pleased to help them make that go. Data.gov, a mixed story of success. There's lots of data, site, data out there, but the number of downloads is not as, uh, as ambitious as you might like it to be. So just, you know, uh, the theory side, we believe there's a good foundation of theory in this area, and we hope this week you'll learn some more of it about social network analysis. Mark and Alan this afternoon will do a, a show and we'll, we'll give an introduction to social network analysis. Um, but there's a good sort of solid science, math, and CS related aspect here. Actually, the physicists started doing this uh, quite early, and some great computer scientists. I mean, most distinguished, I would say, is John Kleinberg at Cornell. I'm just amazed by the wonderful papers he's produced with my former colleague, Christos Felusis, now at CMU, and Yuri Leskovich, brilliant young student of John's, I guess, and not just John's, and, and then uh, has now gone to Stanford, okay? There's also deep uh, science from uh, social theories, and uh, we'll, you'll hear a bit more about these. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the theories that began to focus on social media, <clears throat> the early theories that Jenny and others contributed, her study of lurking with her student Blair Nonicky was an important one. But, you know, how does Wikipedia uh, engage with its users? Do they go from readers to first-time contributors to frequent contributors? That's the usual argument. But Jenny and I, in the second paper we wrote together, uh, we took 120, we got 120 empirical citations of research, and out of that we distilled this rough model. Uh, Jenny's always saying it, it's not as clean as I like to present it, but that from the half billion Wikipedia readers, one tenth, well, you have, you have you know, a lot of those, one tenth of one percent of them register to contribute. One tenth of one percent, okay? Is there a way we could make it two-tenths of one percent? And I attended the Wikimania conference a few weeks ago here in Washington, and they are concerned because the number of, of editors is flattening at least, maybe declining. The percentage of women participants is lower than they dared believe, and so there was a big effort to change the game and address those issues. And while Wikipedia has a, I would say, rich, complex, interesting, sometimes brilliant, set of motivational structures um, and is a great success story, it's still not clear what it would take to make it go even better. Of the contributors, a small number become collaborators. They discuss by email what the next hundred articles should be about 19th century American musical composers. And they work this through and what the format and structure and they make it happen. So those collaborations are really important and by now, Wikipedia has a rich social structure, and the policy manual is huge. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever read all of the policy manual materials, but um, it's a pretty complicated thing, okay? Like NPOV, neutral point of view, is one of the simple ones, um, but there are many, many, many policies, and I run afoul of them uh, time to time as I, as when I do edit. And then the small number of admins who are the leaders, I think the numbers are at 1,400 now, maybe someone will correct me, but you know, those are the people who make the decisions, who deal with the vandalism, who uh, make policy, and then on top there's a 23-person board of directors for uh, Wikipedia. So they've engineered, they've thought about, and developed over these dozen years 
a very interesting set of structures. It's not just like everybody does what they want. It, there is a well-organized you know, framework under which they work. Okay, um, our work, and it just, I will have to go through and come to an end here in a couple of minutes, but you know, we've been working on Nation of Neighbors as our project, and I guess one of the key things when I'm talking about leaders, I mean, that's our tool on top called Many Nets that lets us look at many of these 400 communities at once. But the key thing, PJ's result with Owl and Sopan, is if you have more leaders, your community works. If you don't have leaders, your community doesn't make it, okay? Uh, it's a classic um, social psychology result, uh, but we found it operated online as well. Thank you, PJ. We, your paper is where? Uh, well, I just presented it yesterday at ASA. So. Okay. It's it out for the journal. For the journal soon. soon. Okay. And just, you'll be hearing more about Node XL later today and through the week. I hope some of you attended yesterday, but Mark, myself, and a dozen others, Bernie too, um, have contributed to making Node XL 125,000 downloads of users, a lot for education. And you've got the copy of the book. If you didn't get the book, then you're entitled to one for the students. I don't know if we have enough for the, for the, for the instructors, for the speakers, but that's it. So Node XL lets you, inside Excel, build a little network, and you can also download from Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, and that's what we've done, creating these uh, networks that we increasingly richly annotate and extract with Mark's guidance of the right kind of social um, information to make it happen. And this, our colleague Scott Dempwilf, this is his PhD work, but uh, part of that was to use Node Excel, and all this stuff on the right are the people in the Human Computer Interaction Lab at Maryland. You'll see our names there and their affiliations with other people at different campuses. These are all state of Maryland data. He had done state of Pennsylvania, but we said, hey, how about giving us a slide with Maryland data? So, <laughs> so we can show that. But that sort of shows you the collaborations across the state of Maryland uh, th as, as shown by NSF grants and the, the co-PI network. Uh, there's the book that you should have in your hands and Social Media Research Foundation that Mark founded and leads continues to be now the home. We're appreciative of Microsoft's support for three years to help launch Node Excel, but now we are a separate nonprofit organization, which means we're struggling. So if you know anybody with a half a million dollars for us, or a million, uh, we need them. Uh, and I guess the technology, and I guess I'm going to leave it at that. Jenny, we decided we would let the time for the go for the student discussion, and Jenny's got to talk about her biotracker work and the citizen science effort in biodiversity for the Encyclopedia of Life, and we'll see if we find a time during the week to put that through. Unless you want, is that it? Is that okay? Yeah. All right.